This is All Things Fitness and Wellness, uniting industry thought leaders and fitfluencers on the mission to inspire innovation and encourage people to live a life fit and well. Brought to you by Fitness World, your fitness, your way. Visit fitnessworld.ca. On this episode of ATFW, the industry series, we have a guest that almost needs no introduction. It is the one and only Mark Mastroff. Those in the industry will know him from his early days and tremendous success bringing 24-hour fitness to life, his involvement in crunch, UFC gyms, and now getting into the esports circuit. This is a multifaceted individual that has a lot of knowledge to share and is ready to provide insights so that we can all propel forward in an industry that we know and love and encourage people to live a life fit and well. Before we get to it, make sure that you hit like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. This is ATFW. So we know in life, risks are so important. And it is saying yes to opportunities as they present themselves. And Mark Mastroff joining me now, you are somebody that exemplifies this to the nth degree. We're going to start with that $15,000 from Grandma. Explain to people the stumble into the fitness industry and some of the resistance that you had before making this leap. Yeah, great question. So for myself, I was, you know, working in another industry, but as a part-time person loving sports and loving to be inside the gym. I was, you know, also working a few hours a week in a gym in exchange for a free membership and was spending about eight hours a week. And uh, eventually that gym traded hands. And when it traded hands, the gentleman who came to acquire the gym approached me to manage it for him. And I said, look, I got another job. I'm really not that interested. He said, well, you know, I'll pay you whatever they're paying you. I said, well, I appreciate that. But I I really don't know that at that point in time in my life, I went to college, got a four-year degree and thought I'd end up running a little gym. Just wasn't what I was thinking about. He's like, well, what if I made you a partner? And that caught my attention. And I said, all right, well, that's interesting. What does that mean? He says, well, if you invest $15,000, I'll give you equity in this facility and you can be my partner. So I said, all right, let me think about it. So my mom and dad didn't have the money. I didn't have the money, but I knew my grandmother might have a little bit of money. So I went and approached her and she was kind enough to loan me the $15,000. So I came back and said, I'm in. And so I left my other job and took that leap of faith to kind of step in to become an owner of a business not knowing what that really meant um, and all the, the risk you take and all the responsibility you put on your shoulders. And uh, I kind of took that leap. And that's kind of that's kind of the piece that I took. And there's a lot of pros and cons when you're, you know, I was 22 years old at the time thinking like, oh, wow, is this really a smart decision? I talked to my mom and dad. They're like, you know, geez, is this really, you want to run a little gym? Because the gyms at the time weren't as prevalent as they are today. Today it's a totally different world. But when I did it, it was like, you know, kind of like a crazy idea. But I really enjoyed the gym business, and I, I found it fascinating, and it was really a, a kind of so tight tight into the community that we were, we were a part of the, the thread of the community that it felt like the right place for me. And you speak to that there about the mindset. Can you remember the 22-year-old mindset making a decision like this? Because I think something a lot of us can relate to when you are at the cusp of a big pivotal moment and massive decision, the imposter syndrome that can start or that voice in our head that likes to have a battle with you. So how did you manage that? Because you were pretty young to have to navigate a big life choice like that. Yeah, I think the naivety of who I was at the time is the only reason I probably was able to make the decision because I probably didn't think it through deeply enough. I think if I had, I probably would have convinced myself, no, this is not a good idea. Uh, But I didn't ask a lot of questions I'd ask today. I just didn't know any better. And at the same time, what I worried about was, am I going to make enough money to pay my bills? You know, I had a um, house I was living in and a car and insurance and, you know, food and other things you had commitments to. So would it pay me enough? And then could I see a future doing this for some period of time? And will we grow? Are we going to have just one gym? We're going to open more? And where would that money come from? But I think the naivety of who I was at 22 allowed me to take that leap of faith. I think if I was six or eight years older, I might not have made that leap of faith at the time. It is kind of nice when you are in that space in life where that little voice, the naysayer, isn't ruling. And really, as we grow as humans, it's about managing that voice when we are looking to make these big decisions. Now, one element, obviously, the naivety is what got you into that space. But you also were extremely observant and conscientious of 
the consumer. From what I understand of yourself, you've always had a strong understanding and connection to that community. And this is how 24 Hour were bo- was born. Because I understand as soon as you're taking over the gym, tons of sweat equity is going in and you start to notice something. Well, yeah. I mean, it, what's interesting is that when we – it was a little 5,000 square foot gym. And when I got in there – you know, it was July. I think we took over the gym in ownership on July 1st. And my partner at the time said, hey, you know, what kind of month do you think we can have? I said, I think we'll have the best month we've ever had. So I looked at the numbers that they had done there and I said, oh, let's just go out and beat those numbers. And again, my naivety was like, oh, this is easy and we should be able to do that. And and we went out. Well, turns out, of course, July is like one of the slowest months in the fitness industry at that time in California. It's summer and people aren't coming in the gym. It's beautiful weather. Uh, people are out and about. And so I went to beat every number that had ever been done. And not knowing any different, we went ahead and we actually beat it. We actually put up the best number that club had ever done in the history of its formation. It had been around for four or five years. And we had new ownership. And I was like, oh, that was easy. That was easy to do. And and years later, I look back and go, what the hell is I thinking? Again, my naivety, it was July. I mean, you're not going to put up a huge number in July, but we did. And then, you know, was as I was in there, what ended up happening is is my, my part of the time that came in was really a computer software guy. And he said, look, I want to build a, a software system that can track members' usage and have a mag stripe to check in under, all these things that had not been done before. So he brought a programmer in, and we spent probably the next year and a half writing at night after about 8 o'clock. I'd stay with him from 8 to 11 or 12 and writing a software. And it was in DBase at the time. So I learned how to code in DBase. He taught me how. I spent a lot of time, which made me really, really think about the industry and the business and how it, how it ran, how it operated. But what I started to notice was is that as we would close the club at 11, you know, people would be in the showers. They didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay longer. People were still lifting weights until they did. So I'd kind of let them stay until like midnight. Then I'd try to kick them out. By 1230, they'd kick out. And then I got tired of staying late. I couldn't sleep as much as I wanted to. So I'd start handing the keys. <laughs> yeah. I'd hand the keys to my janitor. And he'd say, look, people are coming in at 5 in the morning, knocking on the door, 4.30, wanting to get in. Should I let them in? I'm like, yeah, let them in. And the next thing you know is that you start thinking like, well, why do I even close? Why don't I just open 24 hours a day? And so we started opening 24 hours a day, which did two things for me. One is I never had to worry about somebody coming early to open the doors because a lot of times they'd be late and people would be mad. And then at the same time, people could stay as long as they wanted to work out. And we found there was actually a night owl group of people that would come in between midnight and 4 a.m. that wanted to work out. And the 24-hour concept was born out of my ability to try and sleep. I wanted to get some rest. I got to go home. I can't stay here all night. Janitor gets the keys. People are coming in. Next thing you know is we're 24 hours. I get this kid to come in and work 11 to 7 at night. And he's telling me the club's packed. It's busy. And I'm like, holy, this is amazing. Yeah. Well, and I mean, one of the things I find interesting of what you're saying, and we keep referring to it as this young mind's naivety, when in reality what was happening was you had such a belief. There was no possibility in your mindset that this wasn't going to work. You were just going for it, putting the sweat equity together, and the success was unfolding. So you become 24 hours. You see this as a successful concept. How do you grow from there? Because I understand another huge facet of you is not just paying attention to the needs of the consumer base, which we know is ever evolving, but also for the people in behind that that keep systems running? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, you aspire to grow. So, you know, we spend a bunch of time building this software system and then we go to market and you start knocking on the doors of gyms saying, hey, would you be interested in a software system to help manage your club? Like, yeah, we'd love that. And you start talking to other gym owners and you would sell them the software and they would put it in place. But that would turn into, well, how do you run your gym? How do you make this work? How do you become more efficient? And that would lead to me kind of telling them, well, here's how we do it in our gym and here's what I recommend you do. And then that led to, would you be interested in buying my gym because my gym isn't doing very good? And that led to, yeah, we would be open to buying your gym. But not having a lot of money or cash on a balance sheet, sometimes that was like impossible. Other times it was just people saying, look, my gym's not performing. I'll hand you the keys. And I remember we picked up our first gym in San Francisco. And I, I distinctly remember talking to the operator at the time saying, well, how are your financials? Well, let me go get them for you. And he went in a room and he came back out and he put these envelopes on the desk. I go, what are those? Those are my financials. And and I opened them up and it was his bank statements from the bank. Like, here's your you know your monthly deposits. <laughs> here's your monthly withdrawals. I'm like, well, no, that's not a bank statement. That's just your monthly deposits and withdrawals. Well, that's all I have. 
I know how much cash I have in the bank. I was like, okay. So he was struggling. So he said, look, I, I think I gotta, I'm losing money. Would you like this, Jim? So he handed me the keys. I signed a lease with the landlord. We took it over. And I remember the first month, I think we made like $40,000 profit, just stepping in and putting systems in place and doing a good job. And that gym eventually was making a couple million dollars a year, just that one gym. So, you know, sometimes you're just in the right spot at the right time, but you also had the belief, as you said earlier, in your systems and your operations, and then your people who could execute the plan. And at this point, curious, obviously you had this all start from your grandmother and then your family also probably being like, oh, is this not a good idea? And we know sometimes the naysayers can be the killer of the dreams and not to say that they were, but I imagine an expression of concern for someone they care about. Where are they at at this point that all of a sudden your success levels are leaping? They must have just been astounded. Well, yes and no. I mean, because I'm a pretty quiet guy. I don't really brag. I don't have flashy cars. I don't do flashy things. I kind of keep my head down. And I would say until we had an exit, you know, some 10 years later or so that we put a, a number out, even everybody around me thought like, oh, you're just a gym guy. It doesn't make much money. You just have fun. And they had no clue. And then in 2005, when we went to market and we sold the company for just under $1.7 billion, everybody was like, whoa, what, what? No way. <laughs> People were just blown. Minds were blown. Like, this is not possible. How the, how did that happen? But, oh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you make money in that business? Wow, what? So it was pretty funny. But I think, you know, my mom and dad, I remember telling them probably one or two years into the business, I, I had dinner with them. I hadn't seen them in a couple months. You know, I've been so busy. And they're like, you know, how you doing? I said, look, I got to be honest with you, I don't know if I'm going to see you guys much for the next two or three years. I'm just like working 20 hours a day trying to figure this thing out, trying to understand it. And and they were pretty good about it. But I know my mom, I mean, my dad's no longer with us. He passed away a couple of years ago. But my mom's always like, you know, I remember you telling me that. You might not see me. I kind of laughed and you were right. I didn't see you for like five years. I was like, yeah, I went underground trying to crack the code and figure this thing out and get after it. But I think just about everybody we touched – had no understanding of what the industry was and what it could be. And I think when we put that that transaction out there and put that number out there, it brought a lot of attention to the industry and a lot of capital to the industry. And I think a lot of businesses have been born since then, like, wow, this is a real, it's not a cottage industry anymore. It's a real, real business. And, you know, it's been fun to kind of watch others, you know, achieve and excel and grow too. Well, and I think simultaneously, you speak obviously from the industry side, but as a fitness consumer as well, I think the perception of the fitness industry has evolved so much over the years. Now we know it's something we trust. It is spaces that we build our foundations of health and wellness, and yourself has been a huge leader of that. And I think it's from the leaders you created. So talk to me over that span of growing 24-hour fitness about the culture that you cultivated, because I have watched the limited interviews that you've done. And whenever there is somebody that has worked with you along that way, there is a very common thread of loyalty, appreciation, learning. And we know when people grow, sometimes they don't want to share the knowledge, but you really are a sharer of knowledge. So talk to me about some of your main principles that you even stick to to this day. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up you know, in my era of life, you know, it was around sports and team sports. You know, I think when I was a little kid, we had three TV channels. Not that I'm that old, but, you know, in the... Uh, They've expanded the, just a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in, the, in the 70s and 80s, cable TV wasn't really out there yet. So you just went outside and played all day and you played sports. And I always viewed myself as the as the glue to just about any team. I, you know, I would be the kid that you know, would do whatever it took to win. And I didn't need the accolades. I didn't need to be the the star. I didn't need to be the guy that was the best guy. I just needed to win. I didn't really care how we got there. So if I was the point guard on the basketball team, I made sure I got the ball to the right guys in the right moment, in the right spots that they could execute so that we could go out and do well. So from that standpoint, I've always been kind of a team person. And as a team person, and if you're a leader of a team, you're always trying to make sure everybody around you is successful and happy. And so I kind of took that approach into the industry and the business. And so I would hire, train, develop, and give all I could to everybody. And, and I used to call it the inverted pyramid. I, I believe that the pyramid is upside down. You don't work for me. I work for you. And I'm at the very, very bottom of that pyra upside down pyramid. And so I will give you all that I can. And I'm always there for you. If you need me, you call me. Whatever you need, I'm going to be there and have your back. And so that's what I would do for our team, and they would do the same for me. And, you know, we we're fortunate to find amazing people along the way, and, and many have grown and moved on. 
or stayed with us in our in our organizations and have excelled and done phenomenally well. And if you look at the industry, you know many leaders um, in a lot of the platforms today have come through our channel at formerly 24 Hour Fitness or at Crunch or at Fitness World up here in Canada. A lot of the different brands all over the world have been great people that we've trained and developed, put systems in place to enhance their ability to execute and then to foster their growth. And then there's been people that have been inside our organizations that have said, we want to go do our own thing. We want to be entrepreneurial. And we would say like any good business person, hey, we support you. We'll actually fund you. We'll partner with you. We'll help you. And we've done that successfully many times over with great operators who have learned all that we can teach them and have gone off to you know do amazing things on their own and sometimes fortunately with us. I think it's fascinating what you say there, like any good business owner would do, which I agree that's a tremendous quality, but I don't think that's something that you find so commonly. And so I think that's really amazing that you have nurtured and fostered that talent because it's never taking away from your own success. It's building it out even further where you have this amazing sense of community. Tell me what some of your biggest learnings were from 22-year-old you getting those keys as a partner to the exit from 24-Hour Fitness in 2005. What were the kind of the, I'm sure that there were endless learnings, yeah, I mean, but I the could, biggest. I could speak for hours on that. <laughs> Fitness World's 16 British Columbia high-value, low-cost gyms are committed to helping people reach their fitness goals, whatever those may be. Exercise and movement play a pivotal role in supporting people's overall health and wellness. And it is Fitness World's mission to provide the facilities, services, and amenities to help you achieve your fitness your way. I took an early philosophy. I don't know if I where I heard it. I think it might have been my father. But it's like, look, every time you replace yourself with somebody, make sure they're better at it than you are. So if I was doing marketing and it was time to bring somebody in to do marketing, I'd hire somebody who was an expert at marketing and they were way better than I ever was and say, great, you're going to take this off my hands. Whether it was accounting, finance, operations, sales, I always would try to find better people that could step in those positions. So that was a big learning of being able to give things up because some people, they just can't give it up. They still egotistically have to do everything. I've never had a problem doing that. It's like, it's yours, go, make it happen. Um, give people enough rope that they can go out there and, and do their own thing within your system and structure so they feel like they're growing too. And just kind of keep the guardrails around them so they don't go too far right, too far left, but they're kind of straight down the middle and help them kind of get to where they want to go. And then learn from your mistakes each time you come around. Like we used to keep notes, you know, like if we signed a lease with a landlord and they later came back and said, hey, you know, you owe us some money here. You didn't do this. Like, oh, crap, we got to change that in the next lease and get better and better at what you do. And then motivate yourself. So I think motivation is a really key component too. And so in the early days, I used to have this thing in my office, and it was called the doubt wall. And the doubt wall is for everybody who doubted our success or my success or the team's success. Love this. So let's say we had a – at one point we had this guy who was our chief financial officer who I thought was loyal and hardworking and really loved the company, the brand. And one day he came in and said, I don't think you guys – are going to make it. I don't really think the company is going to do well, and I'm out of here. Said, okay, no problem. So I wrote his name up on the doubt wall, and there's his name, and everybody would see it up there. And that guy doubted our success. And the day we came out and sold for a billion seven, the amount of stock he lost, the tens of millions of dollars he might have made, I was just smiling, saying, "Okay, there's another doubter." Um, we used to go to banks and say, hey, "We'd like to borrow money." We're, I think we were at, I think we were at 25 clubs at the time. I think we were 40 million in revenue and 8 million of profit, no debt. We had not a single dollar debt. And we go to the bank and say, we'd like a $2 million line of credit. No, you're in the fitness industry. We're not giving you a nickel. So I'd write that bank's name on my doubt wall, and I would never work with that bank again. Never. Talk about them losing yeah, out on yeah. some <laughs> oh, they lost hefty out. interest. Yeah. So everybody, the doubt wall, people that came in and said, no, I don't want to do a deal with you. I don't want to be a landlord. So I had this massive doubt wall. People come to my office and say, what's that? That's my doubt wall. And they would just crack up, and you know that was a motivator. So sometimes motivation really can be something you take home with you every night and say, I'm going to prove everybody wrong, and I'm going to keep it internalized. I'm not going to speak about it, but I'm going to get after it and I'm going to work my ass off until I get there. So there's millions of learnings along the way, but ultimately you're going to make mistakes. You're going to get burned. People are going to rip you off. People are going to stab you in the back. People are going to lie to your face. You're going to do all that stuff, but you have to stay and internalize everything. Stay humble, stay focused. Don't let them take you off your path and just keep after it. And eventually you're going to prevail and you're going to say, okay, I, I got there. And then you go on to your next act after that. That doubt wall, I love so much because for yourself, as you communicate it, it's easy to say what it was for you. But in that moment, 
And anyone that's ever pursued something in life and you have a doubter or a naysayer, mentally you're then presented with a choice. And people can either use that as the defeat or something that puts out the fire and flame because it starts to play on a loop of the mind. Or you did what you did and literally put it in front of your face and was like, there's the fuel. There's the fuel. Absolutely love that. So you talk about then the next act. So tell me about after 2005. I mean, we know you've gone on incredible ventures. What was the mindset then and what were you looking to tackle? Yeah, great question. So we we had an early investor come in called Macau and Delu, great, great group, and they were uh, put some early money into us to help us grow and, and were instrumental in our growth, helping us, you know, raise capital as needed and debt as needed and, and learned a lot from them. But they reached a point where they had a harvest, call it, you know, 10 years. Most funds kind of have to cash out after 10, 11 years. They forced to pay back their investors. So they came to us and said, hey, look, you know, we, we need to leave. And so I said, right, well, I'll go out and find somebody to take you guys out. And we went to market. And, you know, we hired a banker and unbeknownst to us, I mean, everybody showed up at the table. We were a pretty hot commodity at that point in time. And we ran a very robust process and we had tremendous offers and eventually uh, chose a horse to run with and, and sold to a company called Force Malittle. And at that point, you know, everybody I talked to in the stack was like, you know, well, look, Mark, we're going to invest in your company. You're staying, and they're not selling anything, and you're going to move forward with us all the way, right? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'll be not rolling. I'll roll 100%. I'm not going to take a dollar off the table. I want to keep going and grow this business and take it from whatever it is now, call it a billion and a half in revenue. I like to take it to $5 billion in revenue in the next five to eight years, blah, blah, blah. And everybody was there. And then Force Little came in and kind of preempted, put a big number out there, and Ted Forster ran and he said, yep, eh, we're just going to buy you out 100% and you can go do whatever you want. I was like, well, what? He's like, I'm, I'm just going to hire somebody, come in, and if you can stick around and for a couple of years on the board and help us transition somebody in here, you know, I, I, I think we'll buy you out 100%. And so that was a little shocking to me, but okay. I mean, I've been doing this a long time and um, – all right, if I have no non-compete, Ted, I can go do whatever I want, then I'm open-minded to that. No non-compete, you can go start something new tomorrow. Wow. Which was kind of crazy. So we headed down that path, but about a month before we're set to close in finance, we had this thing called a recap accounting issue where a certain amount of equity had to roll over. And so they came to me and said, hey, would you roll over your equity? And I said, fine. So I rolled over a chunk of my equity. I sold another piece of the equity and got everybody their nice returns. And then I stayed on around for a couple of years. You know, my plan be to help 24 hour grow and not move on. But Ted hired this guy to come in and, and become the new CEO. And my job was kind of develop this guy. And he was in a hurry. He, he just wanted to be in complete control and get me the hell out of there. And he came in and ransacked the whole company, changed everything around. It went down a different path that I couldn't support and understand. But hey, it's Ted's money and he can do what he wanted. How does that, at that feel point. though in that moment? It's, it's kind of crazy. It's hard. Be, yeah, it's hard because they're they're destroying what you built. And it's, you know, the typical Harvard business study where somebody comes in and says, hey, I can take an industry I've never worked in before and I can change it around and make it like the industry I just came from. And unfortunately, it, it unraveled everything. And then they decided that anybody that was loyal to Mark, you know, couldn't stay here. And so they started exiting people right and left for no reason and creating a lot of orphans. So I said, well, maybe it's time (laughs) to go do something else. And so we went out and I decided to take some time off. And and, uh, what was, if I had four hours here, I could take you through it all. But what was really interesting is that when I decided that it was time to move on and Ted and I agreed, hey, uh, just go ahead and do what you want to do. You know, the new CEO there decided to put out a press release that I was leaving. And when he put that press release out, I think he thought that was a way to cleanse himself of me inside the organization. The former founder, you know, the Steve Jobs of that company is gone now and I'm in charge. But what in turn happened was my phone rang off the hook from everybody in the world like, hey, what are you doing? Would you like to come buy my company, invest in my company, run my company, manage my company? And it ignited an opportunity. And and what ended up coming out of that was me investing and getting involved in a bunch of different brands and turning around and competing with my old company within like weeks, which was not something I had contemplated. But, you know, hey, it was interesting. So off I went and decided, okay, well, I can at least put the band back together and take some of the great people inside the organization, the the Mike Feeney's, the Jim Rollies of the world, um, and put them all back into opportunities 
uh, for them to get into. I mean, Adam Sedlak got jettisoned, picked him up, said, hey, how would you like to be the CEO over at UFC Gym? We're about to start with the Fertitas. They're like, I'm in. And pretty soon uh, we put the band back together in a bunch of places and have built amazing businesses subsequently from there. What have been some of your favorite concepts that you've had the chance to get involved with out of that? Yeah, great question. I mean, I really love what we've built um, with Crunch. I think Crunch has become a great, great company. Um, ben Midgley had worked for us and Craig Pepin and I, you know, they're senior guys in our organization. And Jim and I were able to put a deal together with Mike for the brand at Crunch with Angelo Gordon. And we acquired that through bankruptcy and, and restarted it with about 18 locations. And Ben had come out of our company and moved back east and had worked for Planet Fitness for a while. He had left Planet and wanted to start something. So I put him and Craig together, and then we brought them over to build our franchise division over at Crunch and launch that. And now we sit as a 440-location company some short time later, and they've done a phenomenal job with Jim Rowley leading as CEO. I mean, Adam going in at Crunch, uh, over at um, UFC Gym was awesome. He's built this monster platform now in a short period of time. I think they're in 37 countries with franchising around the world. Uh, he's got a bunch of locations all over the U.S., and it's a really cool concept. Uh, Lorenzo Fertitta kind of picked up the phone and called me, and I spent time with Lorenzo, and he really thought it was a great idea to build um, a fitness brand around the UFC because UFC was known as a kind of beat-em-up, black-and-blue kind of concept, but we would soften it, bring kids in and families, and it weren't a place to to basically learn how to fight but come to train like a fighter. And empower people. Yeah, exactly. Well said. So we had a lot of fun building that brand uh, with Lorenzo and those guys before they sold it to Endeavor. Then a new group came in um, and had been kind of working with them. But uh, got a good partner group in there with Summit Partners out of Boston and Rob Hassel and those guys have been great partners for Adam. Uh, Chris Smith's done a phenomenal job with Fitness World up here in, in Vancouver. He's built a hell of a business, and uh, he's doing great work. It's fun to watch uh, as well. Um, we can talk countries all over the world uh, you know, that we have platforms in and have invested in. We built a big business down in Santiago, Chile with Alex Wiesner and, and uh, brought that to market and sold that. Alex is still growing down there. Uh, Chris Dedicek's in Mexico, so I can go on and on. But you know, we've quietly backed and supported great operators that we had relationships with, and then we've been able to take people that have decided not to stick with their former companies and come on board with us and have given them the, the bandwidth and the opportunity, capital, whatever they need to grow. So like I said, we could talk a lot about it, but it's fun to see something start from one and grow into a, a monster opportunity and eventually get to exit and reward all the people that have been on that team building it. I love the joy that I literally can feel off of you when you're saying every one of those names. And I find it really admirable that that literally comes off your person when you're talking about them and their success versus when you speak to your own. And it is because the community obviously is a driver of what fills your bucket. Yeah, for sure. It's like family, right? You you take kids, uh, like a, take a kid like Brian Calgary, who at 15 years old finds himself into the industry and goes to college, plays soccer at college, comes back, joins the industry, and you hand him opportunity. And now he runs clubs all over the country, does a phenomenal job. He's a rising young man star. And you kind of see these people evolve over time. You get, you know, you're proud of the, of the hard work they put in, the effort they put in. And um, you like to see them be rewarded at some point so that not only are they earning really strong income along the way, but ultimately there's an exit and there's something that goes into their their family's kind of uh, uh, pocketbook, so to speak. And you have all these global entities that you've taken part in. Tell me a little bit about some of the fun, innovative adventures that you've taken now into the world of NBA, esports. I mean, you're really seeing opportunities in these places that seem like growing spaces to play and probably a lot of fun for 22-year-old you at the beginning. Yeah, no, I mean, there's no <laughs> doubt. I mean, the, the benefit is you know, I've, I've got four kids and, and they're all, you know, super active people. Uh, they have different passions and different interests. And, you know, we talk about basketball. I mean, I, on my bucket list was always being able to invest in the NBA team. And I was lucky enough to do that with the Sacramento Kings and put some capital work there. One of the investors and good friends of mine is a guy named Andy Miller. And Andy was an investor in the team. We used to have tickets to sit next to each other. 
And one night we came to the game and, and, uh, and he's like, where's your kids? I'm like, well, they're home playing esports. And where's yours? They're home playing esports. We started laughing. And he says, well, maybe we should play esports. I'm like, oh, I suck at it. And Andy's like, yeah, me too. But maybe we should try and get better. So we started talking about, well, maybe we should invest in esports. Maybe it's an up and coming field. And so, you know, Andy's brilliant. Andy's, you know, phenomenal. Um, you know, it was one of Steve Jobs' direct reports at one time at Apple and a and, uh, storied investor. So he said, well, let's go buy an esports company. So we bought one, and that led to buying another one, another one, and, and we created this company called NRG. And then he bolted in, you know, kind of a strategy around social media and eyeballs. And, I mean, over time now, we've become, I think, the one of the largest, if not largest, North America platforms for esports. Had world championship in many of the different sports. Continue to be world champions and winning all the time. And then um, I think we're doing, I think this year, I think the numbers are going to be close to, you know, 2 billion views on our platform. Yeah. And so it's pretty nuts. But we've had a lot of fun building that. And, and Andy leads it every day with a great team. And, you know, he's got phenomenal young guys in there like uh, Grady and others that kind of drive it. And he's got great athletes that perform. These kids are amazing what they can do. And, you know, at the same time, I get to watch my kids still play at home and watch the NRG guys play all the time and cheer them on. They, they love it. So it's been fun. We're going to get to some points and takeaways for industry owners, consumers of fitness. But before we do that, what would you say to 22-year-old you right now? What would I say? Looking at this big portfolio, what would you tell that kid? Yeah, I mean, I, I, get, I get the question a lot, like if you could change anything, what would you change or how do you look back? And I kind of, I tell my kids, I tell my wife to others all the time, like, I really don't look back too much because you can get kind of down a rabbit hole, like, oh my God. You know, I should have done this, should have done that, wish I'd done this, wish I'd done that, because everything's never as good as it could have been. It could have been better. But, I mean, the 22-year-old kid, I'd definitely pat him on the back and say, whew, we made it, man. I didn't think you'd make it uh, to the level you've made it. Um, you had a lot of fun along the way. You definitely made some decisions you might not have made if you had more knowledge. Um, you definitely had some successes and some failures, but it's been a great journey to date. And a lot of times it's like, you know, when are you going to retire? When are you going to stop? And my wife would tell you probably he never will. He'll just go till he dies because he just loves working and he loves, you know, helping people achieve. But ultimately, I, I enjoy life. I enjoy having fun. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy spending time with people. I enjoy spending time with you and learn from you so you get a chance to hang out a little bit. Um, it's all about the journey. But I would just slap 22-year-old me in the back and say, dude, get back in the gym, lift a little bit more, get those calves where they need to be. Those calves aren't a little bit tiny right now. We need to get them a little bit bigger. The calves could always be <laughs> I, the stubborn bit. I'd be, I'd be getting after them hard, but you know, that's, that's the way I would go probably. I love that because obviously physical activity is still a huge part of your life. We were speaking prior to this that it's always beyond the physical benefit. What has it meant to you to have physical fitness, especially being an entrepreneur to that level? Yeah, another great question. I mean, it's, you know, you look back and my, my mom and dad were not super active, never belonged to gyms, but my mom was a smoker until probably she was 50 and we used to beat on her to stop. I have two sisters, stop, stop, stop. And then she started going to the gym. When I started opening gyms, they were interested and they started coming down and my dad started lifting and my mom started lifting. They had a personal trainer and I think it extended their life. I mean, my, my dad lived to be 86 and he passed away. My mom's at 87 right now, still cranking. And I think it added a lot of value. And I look at myself at, at the age I'm at today compared to my, my parents and others. And I, I feel like I'm 20 years younger than everybody. I'm still, you know, going out there and, and competing in sports and playing. You know, I can go out there and play basketball. I can play tennis. I can play pickleball. Um, I can go out there and golf. I can do what I need to do. I still move pretty good. I sleep well. I eat well. I don't worry too much about what I eat. Um, I keep a good eye on myself, and I feel like you know the the 60 of today is the 40 of before, and so I think the longevity of people by being really active is great. And I see a lot of people you know near around my age who are not active. You know, and my wife will be like, "Wow, that guy looks like he's 30 years older than you," and he's like, "Well, he doesn't work out, he doesn't exercise, he doesn't eat right, he doesn't pay attention to his lifestyle, and maybe he'll live to be 100. I don't know, you know, but." You know, at least I feel like I'm enjoying every day. I'm trying to squeeze out all I can as I kind of come into the fourth quarter here of, of a lifespan. I'll see you on the pickleball court. It's very fun, growing yeah. sport. <laughs> <laughs> I find that so very true, though, because we all own a body. And it's amazing how people have no interest in a large capacity. And statistically, this is true because we know the level, I, I think it's 16% of Canadians get the amount of recommended 
activity that they are supposed to in a week. So we are not doing well in that capacity. And we all own a body, but it's like nobody wants to read the manual and the benefits. It's We view it as work. And everything you said there, I saw you light up as you said, hit the basketball board, court, the pickleball, hit the gym. It's play. And it's almost like as humans, we forget these are places to play. The gyms you create, the different avenues for physical activity that you've created in your career, they are literally places for us to celebrate movement and play. There's, there's no doubt. I mean, we were talking earlier today that, you know, wh why do you think less people are as active today as maybe five years ago or three years ago? And I say, well, COVID plays a role, right? Because now you have a built-in excuse. You know, you'd say before, like, ah, I don't want to go to the gym or I don't want to go play tennis or I don't want to walk. I don't want to run. You find reasons not to. But now you got a really good one. Oh, COVID. I might catch COVID. You know, you'll, you'll think that way. And it kind of makes you laugh. Like, you got to get that behind you. You know, if you're high risk, I get it. But if you're healthy, you're doing all the right things. I mean, notice... The healthy people didn't really struggle as much through COVID as those who were unhealthy, right? It was kind of an unhealthy disease. If you were in the unhealthy category, it hit you a lot harder than it hit the healthy people. So, you know, take Canada, take BC, I mean, take Fitness World, take any of the gyms out here. They're awesome. And the people inside it, you know, they come in, they get in, they get out, they get a great workout in, and then they stay active. So if they want to go hit the slopes later, their body's ready to go skiing. They're not going to have lactic acid build up in their quads, and after two runs, I'm done, I can't move. <laughs> I mean, they're ready, they're prepared because they've been training hard to get up there. Um, if they want to go kayaking, if they want to go paddle boarding, if they want to do anything that has to do with activity, you know, the gym can support them doing that during the week so they can have fun on the weekends. And it's, it's only a few hours. I mean, if you take... 24 hours a day. And if you're sleeping eight, that gives you 16 hours. If you're working eight, that gives you eight hours. You got to eat, sleep, rest, every, odds and ends, and the other eight hours. But you, you got time to get to the gym. There's just no excuse, which is why at one point we opened 24 hours a day because we would say to people, well, time can't be an issue because we're open all day, all night. You can come anytime you want. Well, so, and I think if people do a life audit, they can see where the distractions are taking place in their daily. And I think there's as well a huge misconception that they wait for, I'll do it when I'm motivated. And I'm like, no, the motivation comes after you start. And often you look at the ladder and they're like, well, that's a large mountain to climb. And you're like, just get on the first rung. And you'll feel amazing for it. So on that note, obviously, we are celebrating fitness and wellness being all things fitness and wellness. But you are a huge expert of the industry. And you brought up COVID. And we know that that was heart-wrenching for so many business owners and what we saw transpire there. What would be your best advice for those that are in the fitness and wellness sector right now in this aftermath to persevere and keep going? Yeah, I mean, great question. I think obviously, first, I would want to say that of all the countries in the world to navigate the pandemic, I would say personally, Canada did the best job in all my experience. Canada did a phenomenal job. The way the government supported businesses, the way the health directors supported the communities, the way that they decided to open and close businesses accordingly, I think they did a phenomenal job compared to everybody else. Could they have done better? Maybe, sure. But they did an amazing job compared to most. If you take a look at, you know, how do you persevere through here? In the United States, you have like this thing now they call the red states and the blue states. The red states by the Republican Party and the blue states by the Democratic Party. Well, in most of the red states, they stayed open through most of the pandemic. And those areas of, of the country where we're operating were performing phenomenally well. It's almost as if nothing happened. And when you look at the statistics of the number of people that were harmed by the pandemic in those states versus the blue states, it's pretty much a dead race. So staying open proved out to be the better strategy. On the blue states, you know, you had places like California where they shut us down for 15 straight months. And then we opened and they closed us again, or they created mass mandates and policies. So a lot of businesses, you know, you drive around now, not, not just fitness, but everybody has really, really suffered. Uh, there wasn't capital given to people. You could get these PPP loans, but they're hard to come by. So a lot of small mom and pops didn't survive. And so right now, I think you're in that mode where we're hoping to get through the winter this year without any kind of a breakout, knock on. Yeah, knock on barbell, barbell dumbbell. Barbells here <laughs> that we're not going to get there. And ultimately that you're thinking about, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to work hard to pay back our landlords on any deferred rent we have, and we're going to get back to making money again. In, in, in each and every location that we have, whether it's quick service restaurants, whether it's retail, 
whether it's this, whether it's that. And, you know, whether the economy is going through a recession or whether we've got inflation, whatever it is, everybody's kind of pounding through all that. But it's a it's a choppy period of time. I think it goes back to my 22-year-old self that you brought up earlier. I think you should just have a naivety around listening to all that noise and just stay focused on the objectives and just stay after it in a positive way, make everybody around you feel great, make everybody feel positive that supports you and your team, and just get after it each and every day. And every day is a fresh day. Um, but things are getting better. I think each day we'll get a little stronger. I think we'll recover a little bit more. And I would say everything should be back to feeling like normal, provided, again, we get through the winter, which I think we will. I think a year from now we'll be rolling again and things will be things will be great. Well, and from the consumer side, I think the appetite for movement, wellness, that bridge to from gym spaces being all-encompassing now for those spaces, we are seeking that as human beings and the social connection on top of it. So with that said, for those that are persevering and kind of going through the trenches right now in this aftermath, so to speak, I know it's hard to speak on a broad sense because we have such a variety of fitness spaces, but what would be some of the top trends that you would encourage people to maybe focus on? I think um, as we look right now, I think education is getting better and better. There's tons of phenomenal books you can read out there. There's this awesome book called How Not to Die. It's like a thousand pages, but it takes every kind of disease that's humanly possible and gives you information of how to survive it and what to do, what the best remedies are, whether it's it's cancer or, or, or whether it's diabetes or whatever it might be. It has a really, really interesting um, um, kind of breakdown for everything. So it's re- worth reading. I think that recovery is becoming big within our industry. It's, we're, we're kind of doing a lot of work there. Um, if you take a look at our businesses, we've built in cryo uh, therapy we've built in red light therapy uh, we've added in you know called hydro beds and normatech to take compression out of the body and we're doing a lot of interesting things in growing that space to let people recover more quickly from their workouts and from life and from stress i think that's really important i think how you eat you know, you're blessed here in British Columbia and a lot of canada with some amazing food farm to fork as they call it it's amazing here the uh, fish, fresh fish is amazing. So you can eat super healthy and that really helps, I think, your day, your life, your energy levels. Uh, how you supplement it with things you're missing, whether it's you know the sun that you want to have in the winter uh, and you want to take some uh, B12 or whatever it might be. There's lots of things that you can do to read and educate yourself by devoting maybe 30 minutes a day to that. But I do think that people need to put a routine in place and they have to say, look, I'm going to at least put 45 minutes to an hour of vigorous exercise, you know, three days a week. That studies now show if you walk at least 15 minutes after eating, that the glucose will burn through your system much, much faster than if you just go sit on the couch and watch TV. Uh, There's a big study that just came out saying that it adds another six to seven years of your life if you walk 15 minutes after, after a meal. So continue to educate yourself, surf the web, stay focused on, you know, providing yourself with the right body, the right temple to be inside, you know, do the things that you enjoy, whether that's meditation, whether that's classes, cycling. There's so many things you can do. Just stay fresh, stay fa- stay happy, stay motivated and get after it. And I think that's fabulous advice, not just for fitness lovers like myself, but obviously speaking to industry because it can be really easy when things are really tough to let your foundations wane. And those foundations are what is going to serve you to achieve all those goals that you're motivated to work toward. Yeah, no, it's well said. I mean, we have so much going on in life that are being thrown at us. And if you throw in the media on top of that, you know, and you listen to everything that they're saying that may or may not be true, you know, you can tend to get down a little bit. And I just don't think we want to head to that space. I think we want to stay super positive super aware, and super engaged. And if we do that, I think we're off to a good start. I love that you teed me up with that, actually, because there's something that I like to do on these podcasts, and I'm a big believer of that. Your mental diet is just as important. If you're in a negative thought cycle, you more than likely need to do a bit of a life audit and see what it is you are ingesting, because it's the same as if you decided to eat French fries every day, truthfully. But I want to leave people with a motivated moment. So in about 30 seconds here, share with me one of the wisest nuggets of wisdom that's been imparted on you in your life that may inspire something in another. I think, you know, it's a simple kind of phrase that my mom gave me when I was a kid, which was just keep on trucking. 
right? Just keep on trucking. Keep after it every day. Give it all you've got every single day. Be true to yourself and live life to its fullest. That's how I look at it. But I always think back like when times are tough or I got a long day or I had a long day, I just keep on trucking. I put my head down. I bury everything that was negative that day in the ground, and I move forward. You kind of flush it, and you just get after it. But that, that would be kind of my, my thinking really quickly in 30 seconds or left. Just just enjoy it and get after it. Keep on trucking. Mark Mastroff, thank you so much. I really appreciate the fact that you are a sharer of knowledge, and this is what we need in the world right now. We are all looking for that sense of connection. We've all been collectively going through an experience that none of us had ever experienced before and navigating in our own ways, but having the ability to share in a true sense of openness like you have is the difference in the world that we need right now. So I so appreciate you sharing your time because I guess it sounds like you're a busy guy or something. No, I'm not I'm not busy. I got plenty of time for you, but I appreciate you having me on today and I look forward to doing it again. Thanks so much. Thank you. You've just listened to All Things Fitness and Wellness, the industry series. This episode was brought to you by Fitness World, your fitness, your way. New episodes of the industry series drop every Monday and the celebrity series every Wednesday. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe so you never miss out on hearing from industry thought leaders and influencers. We are on a mission to help everyone live a life fit and well.